<laughs> okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> so um, that'd be a good good recording there uh, for all the lip readers. To... <laughs> so like I said, we'll go over some of the ties, the type of flies and, um, and uh, the tools you need and then something called recipes. All the flies, they're like cooking. You have a recipe to follow. Um, and then we're going to do some demonstration. Um, Paul will be our um, our uh, tying demonstrator. He's going to do a couple of the kind of the easier to tie patterns, and um, and we'll show you some of the resources uh, online and, and retail where you buy the uh, the tools and the materials for this sport and give you some hints on it, and then. Um, Later in March, we're actually going to have a, a five-week school uh, here in the library in this room for fly tying. So we'll give you some information on that if you want to learn more about it. And um, and um, in time permitting, uh, we'll um, several of us bought some, brought our equipment, and we'll uh, uh, you know help uh, tie up some flies and maybe give you a um, kind of a beginner's lesson there. This picture is from our class. This is the first time we've done fly tying in person uh, in three years. Uh, this is our class we did in 2020 um, that we had to uh, cancel the last, I think one or two classes of it, we had to abruptly end when COVID hit, but, um, but uh, we've had a good time uh, doing fly tying. Um, okay, and then uh, hopefully we'll leave. Uh, if you have any questions, um, you know, feel free to ask them and we'll, uh, we'll uh, give you our experiences of it. Um, just a little bit about who we are. Uh, we're the uh, one of uh, 387 TU chapters in the United States. Uh, 27 of them are in New York. New York is actually one of the uh, biggest states as far as uh, trout and limited chapters. And uh, this is kind of the boundary of our territory. The reason it's shaped so funny is it's based on zip codes rather than you know counties or towns so that's why you got this kind of oddball shape here but our territory is primarily Ontario and Steuben counties a little bit of Livingston county and Wayne county also so we have a lot of water in this area that um, uh, we help look after the mission of trout unlimited is uh, cold water conservation so we're not really a fishing club per se but our real mission is to um, um, help preserve uh, the environment uh, that allow cold water species of fish, trout and salmon to survive. And, and this area is kind of the boundary of about how far south trout can um, survive. And uh, so it's one thing we want to watch, you know, carefully. Um, and we do a lot of different conservation work, uh, particularly on the Cohocton River. And Ralph is our, our conservation chairman and leads a lot of those projects. But we do things like uh, help the DEC uh, stock trout in uh, March and April and um, do a lot of tree planting and um, have done some other things. We installed a um, unit that does uh, temperature uh, monitoring on the Cohocton River. And for those who don't know where the river is, here's the village of Cohocton. It roughly follows Interstate 390, which runs through the Cohocton Valley. You cross the river several times if you've ever driven south on um, on 390 towards uh, uh, like Corning or that area. And um, also uh, six of the, the Western Finger Lakes are in our area from uh, Keuka Lake all the way over to the Little Lakes, uh, Canisius and Hemlock and, and so forth. So a lot of water. And then there are Namesake Lake in Canandaigua here. So we do a lot of other things. We also have an intro to fly fishing school where if uh, people want to learn how to cast, do fly casting and, and stuff, we hold that in May. And we have a monthly newsletter that we publish um, that we send by email. Um, we call Tight Lines, which um, is um, pretty well regarded if I say so ourselves. We get a lot of nice compliments on that. And then we have a, a New website also, canadaguilaketu.org. And a lot of, we'll actually be showing you things, fly fishing and fly tying resources on our website. Um, John has uh, built our website a few years ago and did a fantastic job on it. So it's a good way you can get in touch with us and uh, join TU if you're interested in 
and some other things. And then we, um, a lot of this stuff we had to set up when we all of a sudden had to go online during COVID. So we have a YouTube channel now too. And uh, this recording of the meeting will actually uh, upload onto YouTube. So uh, we're getting real high tech in our, in our old age here. So we've been around, I think since 1989, 1990. Uh, the chapter is uh, Max in the back there. He's one of their original members. Um, so, <laughs> so one of the charter members. And um, hi, come on in. <laughs> uh, so that's who we are. Um, and just real quickly, some of the things we have coming up. Uh, we meet on the second Monday of each month. And so, um, which this is uh, January 9th and February 13th is our our next um, chapter uh, meeting. And we hold those usually at the uh, American Legion in Canandaigua, right on North Main Street. Um, that's kind of our, our um, usual meeting place. And in February, we're having a um, one of our sister chapters from the Ithaca area, the Leon Chandler is gonna do a presentation on year round fishing in the Finger Lakes. In March, we're doing a uh, presentation at the Orvis store in uh, Pittsford Plaza, which is one of our kind of our big resource for fly fishing in this area. And a really well-known um, fishing guide and author, Rick Custage from the Buffalo area will be coming over and, and giving a presentation. And then our fly tying school, like I said, is here. It's every Wednesday in March from the 1st to the 29th. And then in um, April, we're doing a meeting um, uh, targeting uh, women, uh, women's invitational, we're calling it. And actually uh, our uh, person on Zoom is gonna be our guest speaker, uh, Ms. Adina Brown, who is the vice president of uh, diversity for New York State for uh, Trout Unlimited. And her mission is to get more women involved. Right now about 95% of TU members are men. And um, probably the biggest opportunity we have to grow the organization is to get more women involved. Uh, so that's really one of our, um, one of our goals. Uh, and then I mentioned in May, we have a, our fishing uh, class in Onanda Park on Canandaigua Lake. And then we, uh, we like to have fun in the summer. We have a picnic uh, every June, and then um, we do a bass and panfish fishing uh, event in Bowton Park, just down the road from us in East Bloomfield. The park commission gives us uh, permission to have out people outside um, Victor, and Bloomfield to uh, fish there. Normally it's residents only in that park. So that's a, a fun event we've started. So that's who kind of who we are and, and what we do. This is a picture of our, our website and TU and our uh, YouTube channel. Okay, so um, let me uh, switch gears here. And uh, uh, let's see, uh, Ralph, you were gonna talk about the type of flies, right? The, okay. Yep, you were all set there. And just uh, this is by no means a complete section on all the kinds of different flies that are around for most of these we have male African born bird groups. We just use this part of the world with and I'm gonna, I will pass these around. Um, feel free to open them up and if they happen to fall out of the world. You want to stand here and sorry, Mike. <laughs> sorry. Fall out of the little slots there and just put them in the box and close the top of the top. Um, just stay in front of the piece to you'll be on camera. Okay. Um, the first set that we're going to talk about are, are uh, wet and dry flies. Yeah. And uh, uh, I've got a whole selection here from some of the hatches you'll see. Hatches being, first of all, how many people here fly fish or have fly fished? <laughs> Okay. Oh, awesome. and, and how many of you, uh, forgetting board members for a minute, um, have tied flies before? Okay, so you're not novices. And are you signed up for the class? Good, good. Okay. So um, I've got a whole bunch of different flies in this uh, uh, box. The bottom row, uh, unless you turn around, will be the top row, but you'll tell they're very different, are wet flies. Uh, I've got um, a variety of wet flies from uh, March brown wet to a couple of concoctions of my own to a, uh, a doctor, Professor Hawk. Uh, on the top, I've got some um, 
Hendrickson, some uh, sulfurs, uh, March Brown. I've got some uh, little beetles and ants and some caddis flies and so on. Turn that around. Okay. So that's pretty much some of these flies that you're seeing here. And these are all flies that you fish on the top of the water. So this is nothing new to all you guys. You already do all this stuff. So next. All right. So the next uh, would be nymphs. It says nymphs and streamers on here, but I've kind of separated them into two parts. Um, a lot of the nymphs we use are the, the stone flies, the uh, uh, imitations for the mayflies that we have in the stream. Some of us don't use them at all. Um, but anyway, that was a shot at one of our board members. Anyway, um, and then a lot of them are just supposed to create a reaction from the fish. They're not any specific fly that you would ever see in the water. And you'll see some of these are, you could think of them as gaudy or sparkly or, or something. Um, and so, uh, but what you'll see a lot of times is people in this area are fishing things like uh, pheasant tails or uh, flashback pheasant tails or beaded pheasant tails and the whole same thing with hare's ears. Those are typically some of the more common uh, bugs that are, we find in the water. So these are these are all nymphs. Okay. The nymphs are underwater. Underwater, right. <laughs> then uh, I've got a, a small box of streamers. The small ones at the bottom are all what I would call classic uh, trout streamers. There's a gray ghost, there's a, uh, a baby brook trout, there's a, a black nosed dace. And then there's some other uh, other streamer type flies in here, including a muddler and a conehead muddler. Uh, and there's a couple uh, couple pretty jazzy streamers tied by another person in this room in this box. You'll recognize them. The streamers you're imitating, not bait generally, fish. But bait Typically bait fish, sometimes crayfish. Although in this next box, I have some crayfish patterns. The next. The next group of flies that you might use it's not working on either way. There we go. All right, so the next group of flies uh, are things that you might uh, probably fish for for bass or for panfish, but not totally. There's some uh, there's a couple of clouser minnows in here and a, what's called an Osable ugly, which is a, and, and a couple of woolly buggers, all of which people use uh, for trout effectively. There's also something in here that looks like a, a worm and that's a squirmy wormy. Uh, and probably the simplest fly that to tie in the world called a green weenie. Um, so I'm gonna pass these around too. Mm -hmm. A lot of times with these flies, you're imitating uh, frogs or um, crayfish, crayfish or uh, dragonflies, beetles, wants, <laughs> so on. So, if there's any questions, mm -hmm. let me know. All right, thanks, Rob. So um, these are the kind of flies you can learn how to tie and. and when you're doing that. So it's not just the traditional, everyone thinks of the mayflies and, and so forth, um, but um, really anything that swims, you can catch fly fishing. So that's where you'll uh, make some of these other patterns up. So to, in order to get started in fly fishing, um, Bernie's gonna go through uh, just some of the, you know, the tools you need to get started. And because um, there's a lot of different, uh, it looks kind of daunting here, but I'll let you talk about uh, just what kind of tools you need, what to do, what to buy, what not to buy, and, uh, and some of those things. Mm -hmm. Sure. So probably the most important um, item that you can buy and that you should spend whatever you can spend on, what you can afford, is the vice. And a vice is this thing. That's what holds the hooks in place. So that gives you something that you can work on. Some vices are rigid, meaning they don't move. Other vices you can rotate like this to help you wind things. Um, how their jaws work 
are adjustable so you can tie tiny flies um, as indicated in some of those boxes or you can tie really big flies in the same vise. Okay, so the vise, and it comes two different ways. This is a pedestal vise, so I can move this around. I can move this pedestal around, set it you know, on any table I want, take it with me. The other is a clamp style vise. It clamps to the edge of the table. And that's your kind of limited as where you can do that, the thickness of the table. So they come in two different configurations. Um, but like I say, if you can afford whatever you can afford, buy the most expensive vice because you will not wear it out. I've had this vice, um, I'm thinking probably 15 years, and I haven't worn the jaws out of it yet. And I haven't had to buy another one because as I, progressed in my tying skills. I didn't have the need to say, hey, this is wobbly. It doesn't hold the hook. Um, so it's like anything, you get good quality tools, you can't go wrong. One of the things uh, that also is important is a light, okay? I am uh, getting up in age and this little guy right here, that magnifying glass, is a lifesaver. This is a, a two-stage magnifier. It has an LED light around the side. So it lights your hook. And you'll see that when we do our tying, tying video, you'll see how important it is to be able to see, okay? Uh, next item would be scissors. Scissors are important. You can buy cheap scissors and that's what you'll get. You can get good scissors and they're sharp and they'll last a while and they won't get dull. You find scissors that are comfortable in your hand. Um, if you're young, you don't need very big loops. Older you get, your fingers get big, bigger. A uh, couple ladies will want smaller loops, easier to control. But one of the things that happens as you tie, and you can see the difference in the size of the loops, okay, different styles you start to tie and the scissors kind of just like become part of your hand. So that all you have to do is just like flip your thumb over to clip something out. So very important scissors. So the next item is called a whip finisher. And this probably is the most difficult tool to master. <laughs> In fact, we may have just one class on how to use a whip finisher. <laughs> and all it does, it's a fancy way of tying overhand knots on the hook. And it'll pull the thread back out and it secures the knot because there's nothing worse after you're spinning all the thread and you get ready to tie it and you go to tie the knot and well, the thread breaks or the knot slips and you watch the feathers just come undone. <laughs> or whereas it comes undone when you're fishing and you know. That's yeah, and that's <laughs> even worse. Um, head cement, this is a uh, applicator bottle that I use. Uh, they come with brushes. Uh, this particular applicator bottle is uh, filled with Sally Hansen's hard as nails. And this is probably some of the best non uh, fly fishing related glue I use. <laughs> you can go to Orvis and buy head cement and just go to the drugstore and get Sally Hansen's hard as nails. And what's even better is you can raid your kid's nail polish remover and keep it liquid for as long as you need. <laughs> it's nice because I had two daughters so I had plenty of supply of this. All right. Um, some of the flies that Ralph showed you had elk hair or deer hair on them. They look like stiff wings on those. And this is called a hair stacker. So when you trim hair off of a, off a hide, you want the tips all aligned. So you add the tips in, tip down, and then tap this on the table. And then you pull it out and they're all aligned. So you can grab them and make them uniform on the hook. 
This particular hair stacker has two different sizes, one on each end, so I can use large or small amounts of hair. Next thing is how do I hold those tiny little feathers? Hackle pliers. And this is one version of a hackle plier, basically a. Oh, we don't have a camera on it. No, you can see it on the upper right. Oh, okay. No. So this, you can see as I squeeze it, it opens and closes. But what that'll do is hold the feather and you can wind it around the hook. Okay, it comes in different types. Um, this particular one has a swivel in it and a same, same kind of set of jaws that clip like that. But this one allows it to rotate a little easier. Okay. Then we have fly tying thread. And I have this set up. I have uh, fly tying thread and the corresponding bobbins. So these are the thread, and the thread comes in different sizes. Small flies require thin, very thin thread. So you can go from 16 aught all the way up to three aught. And the bobbins that hold them are important because that allows you to apply tension to the thread and to the fly itself. Because this is about the only place in the world where tension is good as you're winding that and keeping that thread tight on the hook. Okay, so you can have bobbins that look like this that have ways to adjust the tension. Other bobbins are straight and are basically just metal that's bent in and then there's no real good way to adjust the tension other than holding it by your hand. So I use these bobbins for different things like this is wire, um, lead free wire that I use to weight hooks. So I use it on the bobbin because it makes it easier to control and easier to um, minimize waste. Okay. Uh, last thing I have, or actually I have one more item. Um, this is called a dubbing needle. Okay, this dubbing needle is very handy. It allows you to actually separate fibers. It allows you to move things around on the hook. It allows you to grab a little bit of glue, drop it in very specific locations. When you find one that fits your hand, uh, and I really wouldn't tie without one of these. It helps you sort hooks on the bench. It helps you grab a bead if you're using beads to. Um, weight the hook. And then the last thing is this. As everyone knows, you need to brush your flies twice a day. Now, this helps you keep everything. Once you tie it, you can move the feathers around, helps separate the barbules on feathers, helps you rake out some of the dubbing. Um, a very, you know, you can't go wrong having a toothbrush sitting around. Okay, any questions on any of this? No? Guys, you got any questions back there? <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, so we saw what the flies look like. We have the tools, now we wanna tie one. So what do you need? A tire. A tire, that helps. So when you're gonna have dinner, what do you usually do? You get a recipe? So we have recipes that we use to tie different flies. And recipes can come from all kinds of sources. Um, Let's go to the next slide here. I'll show a recipe there. How's it go? No, it's page down. Okay. <laughs> so there's your standard recipe. It tells you what size hook you want to use. Uh, what size thread way up the top there? What the tail is made out of, what the body is made out of, what the hackle and the wing. You can see on this list, we need some thread, we need dry fly hackle, which are basically rooster feathers from a specially bred chicken. 
um, quills and wood duck feather. Okay. So where do you go to get that stuff? Your wood duck feather store? <laughs> Burn log. <laughs> <laughs> Um, not necessarily, but a lot of times they start from the back end of the hook and move forward. So you'll see the tail and then it comes forward with that. But that's typically the format that they use. So you can find recipes everywhere in magazines, online, YouTube videos. And when I first started doing this, we had books. So you get a book and you look at a book. Now, I can punch up a video, watch how it's done, save all kinds of frustration because I don't make the mistakes over and over. I watch the video and then I know what I need because it's usually published right at the end. Okay. So you have like, this is my recipe book. You know how sometimes cooks don't share recipes because it's like, you, you know, bakers like to keep secrets. This is my secret book of recipes. <laughs> I have trout flies, streamers, lake run flies, hatch charts, and saltwater flies. So if I find something cool, I'll take a picture of it and then I'll write out my own recipe. And if I watch a video and I get kind of confused, I write my own instructions out so I know in different steps. So you can. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the recipe part okay any questions i made one point too if you if you're you know when you're cooking and all of a sudden you don't for some ingredient you don't have um don't uh, you know improvise like if you don't have wood duck feathers uh but you have mallard feathers you know don't you know don't sweat it you can um um always use a different uh type there was i you know one what was that one goose biots what, what the heck wherever that is that's so it's so you because a lot of times you'll buy a whole package of some material to tie one fly and then you've got like you know this six dollar bag of things that you might <laughs> that will last a lifetime so yes um i've actually i uh, used to uh, brush my cat and I would use the fur <laughs> from from the cat as a, was was called dubbing. So uh, that's kind of fun too. Once you get into it, is to kind of improvise and just use uh, uh, household materials. One of the other things that you can do is someone else's house. You're gonna buy something. Yeah. Like you can split a cake, buy a full cake, and you Yeah. Material. One thing we didn't mention here, though, is if you think you're going to tie flies to save money, no, no, that's a myth. <laughs> no, because it, after a while, like just like about prices on some of these, like this is a three dollars for this bag of uh, black marabou, and then oh, I need a yellow one, so I spent another three dollars, and then I wanted a chartreuse, so I spent another. So um, whereas flies you buy in a store, you know. Two, three dollars, four dollars or so. So it's just a rewarding something on something. Yes, very rewarding. Yeah. Um, so uh, now we're actually going to tie some flies. So let me, um, I'm going to stop the screen here. We're going to do three different patterns, right, Paul? Uh, yeah, so I chose three different flies because of the, the different types of materials that are on the flies. Um, they're all handled a little bit differently. Um, I'm going to switch cameras so here. We'd uh, kind of pick up a little bit of something on all of them. Okay. Doing that, whatever. Um, we're going to do a woolly bugger, um, an elk hair caddis, and a griffith gnat. Um, the bugger is a streamer type fly. Um, it was first tied around 1966 by somebody called Russell Blessing out of Pennsylvania. It's a very um, universal fly. I mean, everybody who fishes pretty much, I, in every one of my boxes, there's a bugger. Either it be a, a green one, a white one, a brown one, a purple one, whatever, a black one. 
Um, when you don't have anything else and you can't figure out why the fish aren't biting, I usually will tie on a small bugger just to see what's going to happen. And that seems to be something that, uh, that works rather well. Um, they're good for panfish, they're good for trout, they're good for uh, bass. You can get, I, I tie, actually, I tie a, a, a size four, which is a big one. I use it for bass fishing at my cottage, and they love it. Um, I tie them down to as far as an 18. Um, just for doing panfish type things, and uh, that uh, it, 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 it covers the whole gambit um, of fish, and it doesn't really seem to imitate anything particular. It's kind of a stimulator at the same time. Um, it's flowing. It's got lots of uh, fuzzy stuff that flows, um, and uh, that we can probably get started here. Are we on here? We look like yep, we're, uh, we're looking good here. So, uh, better? Yeah, better? If that's better than, than nothing, we'll try it. We'll try it. We'll try, to, try this with this cardboard. <laughs> You're a better man than me. Better I'd be knocking that thing over. I'd be. <laughs> First thing we're going to do is put a little, little lead weight on it. One thing about hook size is the bigger the number, the smaller the hook. So, yes. like a size 20 hook is really tiny, and a size four hook is uh, fairly big. Which one is that that you got on? Yes. That's a size eight. That's a size eight. So that's a. And thread that kind of just locks everything down. And I think once they get to the big salt water, it starts going in reverse when you hit reverse zero. Exactly. <laughs> so goes. Yes. All the way to the end. <laughs> Thread base keeps everything from hopefully from sliding around on, on the hook. Um, a lot of flies uh, get pretty slippery with some of the materials. And uh, so what your best thing to do is put down a thread base first. That gives everything so uh, it doesn't move around. You know, marabou, pick a nice one here. Get some of the fuzzies out of it. Marabou is from turkeys. turkeys. What is it, the chest or the neck or something of a... For the turkey, yeah. Proportions are, are, are kind of everything. And that gets to be something that you kind of just learn to do. Um, and that's exactly what it is. It's you, you do it by doing, and by tying. Usually like these, and every time, every something too, every fly can be tied in a different manner. Uh, you'll see it on, 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 on the internet, it'll be tied by one person, they do it this way by another person do it that way. Um, variations of tying certain flies, of, uh, especially the flies that are, are, are pretty much a regular type fly, um, very kind of a universal that everyone uses. You don't have to stick exactly to the recipe. Like Gordon said, if you don't have a piece of, of this, substitute something that you have sitting on your bench or in your box or something and give it a try. Um, a lot of times you won't have something and you just say, well, you're halfway through the fly, what are you going to do? You know, you do? No, I, don't, I don't have any marabou. What am I going to do instead? Well, kind of stuff. I can try something and drop dry hair. So tails usually should be about the length, the full length of the, of the hook shank. Tie it in with a couple of wraps. Let's see what it's going to look like. That's yeah, about. One of the easiest mistakes to make on this fly is to make the tail too long. Yeah. Then when you get a bite, the fish will bite the tail and bite the tail. not get the hook in their mouth, and <laughs> you'll feel the bite and, <laughs> and not the. Uh... Thing that I do is I can leave it all on and use it for pulling up for bulk. <laughs> Soften up. An angle. Back down to the end here. I just moved Gordon. There you go. Yep, good. Well, a little flash is something uh, some fires put down. I will on this one. What I usually do is I usually use a whole a whole strip of flash, and I just bend it in half. You when the marabou on the tail gets wet, it kind of it really neat. It looks like it almost undulates. So okay. these. Uh, Flies, you imitate things like leeches or minnows, and it, um, so it looks bushy now. But when it gets wet, it's uh, really kind of streamlined and. 
pull it over, put it on one on the far side of the hook. Hold over the other side, bring it on the near side of the hook. Cut those off at the end. I usually like to like them a little bit longer than the tails. <laughs> Little bling on the fly. Mm -hmm. Apple here, that'll go in. Not yet. I get a little ahead of myself. You can use wire or you can use tinsel. I prefer tinsel over wire sometimes. I'm gonna put a piece of tinsel in. Oh yeah, that'll work good. <laughs> so. um, Mr. Saddle, I think I'm holding it up so I can see it too, as far as that goes. But also, I'm having trouble seeing it. <laughs> glasses, so I'm just gonna have to put one. Yeah, here again, you have to have good light on your work area. And I had one friend of mine, he bought a, uh, a one of those jeweler goggles. You know, <laughs> so you could really I have a pair of those too, also. <laughs> yeah. Body is made of a piece of chenille. This piece of chenille just happens to be, has a little bit of sparkle in it. <laughs> On the near side of the hook, tie that in, that down to the end. There's only about, um, well, there's kind of three or four basic materials and then you, you put the flashes in there. There's not a lot of materials in the recipe. I'm gonna wind this all the way up. This one's out of the way here. If you have what's called a rotary vice like this one, this is where you can kind of spin it to uh, put that on. Or didn't, so I was, uh... <laughs> Cutting materials off. Everybody does this, including me, as far as that goes. If you always cut above the hook, uh, your bobbin hang, you'll never cut, you'll never cut the thread. Um, Everybody kind of comes sometimes comes down underneath them, and next thing you know, you go like this, and boom, the bobbin falls straight down. <laughs> We've all done it, I'm sure. Or break, or break the thread on the break hook. The on the hook. Yeah. <laughs> that go. Armored all the way up the front. Bring them back a couple more straps underneath. This particular color is a, a real good imitation of a crayfish, mm -hmm. olive. And um, you so put a, just a little bit more of something just to kind of add to it. Kind of back and forth through the, through the hackle. Also adds a little bit of durability. The wire does. A lot of guys, people use wire. Swear by putting the durability in it. That's a good point. Let go of it like I just did. You know, one of my mistakes is always not securing that hackle. And then after you catch a fish or two, the whole thing unravels and Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I joke around, and when I my flies look like something that hit your windshield. 
So that's a. <laughs> now, the infamous wet field finish tool. It's hard to explain how to use it, but I'll do my best on trying to do that. It's better to. I'm going to get that. Can you still see the hook? Yes. Yeah, yeah you're fine. <laughs> And is that to learn to do? Like a bride and bike. Right, it is. <laughs> Four or five turns and I would have finished without tightening it up. You can also do a uh, simple half hitch. Um, with one of our members, uh, yes, <laughs> I was going to mention his name. But... I'll never use the bobbin. There was no such thing as the bobbin. Yeah, no, so he would just kind of do this uh, twirl and do a series of half hitches. Toothbrush again, there it is. <laughs> That's a nice looking fly. <laughs> okay. So that uh probably couldn't make them at all. Any questions on how it went up or how it didn't go up or And you tie this in just a variety of colors. colors. Like if you tie one that's a white or chartreuse, it's a deadly uh, minnow Im imitation. Um, and that's kind of the fun. You see all the different colors of, uh, like I've got yellow, chartreuse, brown, black, white, um, and just any combination of those and um, just have a party with it. And, Mm -hmm. I, I don't recall um, when I first learned being taught to drop with the excavated red wire. All the lead does is helps the, helps the, the, the fly get down faster, yeah. is what it does, and keeps it down along, along the way. Um, you don't have to tie it with lead. You can use, sometimes you, what you can wind up using, if you don't want to use the lead, you can use tungsten beads instead. Uh, tungsten is very, very heavy. So the beads are going to be heavy, so the beads are going to hold it down. So you really don't need to have the extra weight to it down. Um, these aren't tungsten. That was not a tungsten bead. That was just a plain brass bead. And so in order to get it down, if I'm going to be fishing something deeper, um, I go ahead and wind up using something like that. It's primarily for your wet fly. Yes, this is a wet fly. Simply yep. a wet fly. Yeah, this is a streamer the category, they would call that. Mm -hmm. And the, the, it's not actually lead anymore, is it? Or I'm still I, using lead because you're I still, have, oosh. still have plenty of it. So. Yeah, that's true. You bought it years ago. Years ago, and uh, went a long ways. Yeah, the one I, I guess it's made out of tin or something. That's yeah, they say it's non-toxic. Yeah. One of the things you might have noticed when you're trying to fly, three parts trying to fly is the tail part once you learn the back and forth, get it comfortable in your hand and place it on the hook. And that's an important feat. I don't tie anymore because my hands won't do that. <laughs> but it's um, material control is a big key to success with life. Not now, Norton. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh oh. What did you do? No, no, it's the computer. It's, uh, you're <laughs> <laughs> Why the grip is net. This is a dry fly. Can't get anything by you guys. <laughs> Griffith net, this is a dry fly, but I have actually fished this wet also, as either way. Um, if it's not working on, working on a dry day um, and it doesn't want to float, sometimes what I'll do is I'll get it really wet and I'll go down and I'll use it like a nymph and just bounce it off the bottom. Just let it roll. Sometimes this works out just as good as it does as sitting on top of on top of the, uh, the surface of, of the water. Um, it's not really a nymph, but uh, 
Fish don't really sometimes don't know that. Um, <laughs> it's like legs on a fly. Fish can't count. They don't know if they got six legs or they got 10 legs. You know, they just see things like this and what they normally know is something on top doing this, it's food. <laughs> so, um, you know, even though they would go to school, they may not, you know, <laughs> learn much as far as that part of it goes. One old joke is if fish could count, we'd never catch anything. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that's uh, kind of crazy about it. Uh, Griffith's net. Two materials, and that's it. Peacock hurl and hackle. Um, and that's it. Um, it's a fairly easy fly to tie. It's rather productive. Um, look at by the name of Griffiths. I know his name. It's George Griffiths. Right. Uh, tied this. I don't I didn't have a date on when this when he first tied these, but George Griffiths is a founder of TU International. Which I didn't know. I just saw that just came up the other day when I was looking for a little, little uh, information about the flies I was tying. Um, it is a midge. You can tie them anywhere from size 14, which this is, to a 24, if you can see a 24. I can't see a 24 anymore. I don't know if anybody else can still see a 24, but uh, it'd be darn if I can still do that anymore. Um, Al was always the one that used that I was always amazed of that he could tie 20s, 22s without a bobbin and he could do it by hand. And that was just amazing that he could. He didn't wear glasses either. He didn't wear, no, he took his glasses off when he used to tie. <laughs> so, that was even crazier. Um, I couldn't do it. There'd be no way that that would happen for me. But, uh, <laughs> it imitates small, just small insects in general on the surface. Um, they're really good on still days. I've noticed that if you're working your riffles and things like that, I, Griffiths is not a way to go, but I'm not on, a, on a still stream and you plop one in really nice and just kind of just tweak it a little bit once in a while, it, it, it becomes a deadly, deadly fly. Okay, what do we got here? Whoops. You ever see those like the flying ant insects and things like that? That's kind of what midges are, right? The, yeah. the... Okay. Little tiny bugs, gnats <laughs> is the name. This material here, go all the way to the bend. And this is the tricky area here. That's where you can clock the thread on your hook there and snap <laughs> it off. If you do break the thread, just start over again. Start over again. That's the best <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> Yeah, curl is kind of an interesting material. Um, let's see, stem off a peacock feather, one with the big iridescent eyes on, and uh, comes from just below the eye, is really the best. If you can find it, it's kind of a strange thing to kind of get a hold of sometimes. They have good kinds and they have terrible kinds. I did is tie this in by the tips, these two or three of them together. Very brittle material. <laughs> a lot of these materials too, you don't necessarily have to buy at a fly tying store. You can actually, a lot of art supply, like Michael's art supplies here mm -hmm. and Victor and um, we'll have you know, you can, like one peacock feather will last you like your lifetime, probably. Pretty much. Yeah. You know, much I know one pheasant tail I've had for 12 years, I think. So, grizzly <laughs> hackle from, from, from to a chicken. Head in first. If you look at feathers, they all have a set to them, down or they're up. You tie them in with down when you go to wind them up from the back of the hook, they'll face the back of the hook. Tie them with the feathers facing up or the dull side, feathers will all face forward to go make the hook. If you're tying the hackle in from the eye of the hook to go backwards, most of the time you want it to go the opposite direction. And that can be a little bit uh, like another case in itself, but in that case, what you wind up doing, you wind up pretty good so that the shiny side is up and the dull side is down. Yeah. 
then feedback to get get all of them. Nice thing about peacock is the the iridescence of the mm -hmm. color. Yeah, it's really a, looks like a hologram kind of a. Real buggy looking material. <laughs> you do make a synthetic. It looks pretty pretty good. All you do is just wind this all the way up to the eye. Give yourself a little bit of extra room. Everybody crowds the eye when you first start to start to tie. It's another common <laughs> state that a lot of I'll show you a trick with that because I that was something I thought about. How you cannot glue the eye. <laughs> Beckle, follow that right up with it. mistake I made was getting too big a hackle so it just looked like this big feathery thing there but <laughs> the eye come over the eye mark <laughs> that Yes. Hackle, I'll use this one right here. Hackle, you want to wind up using a hackle approximately is the distance between the um, the shank of the hook and the bottom of the barb. Uh, I mean, the bottom and the actual point of the hook. Um, or you can use a hackle a, a hackle gauge, which what you do is you wind up placing it over the gauge like this, and as the barb will stick up, the gauge is then go ahead and is, is um, calibrated and size of the hooks. Uh, you can go a little bit larger, a little bit smaller sometimes. A lot of times you just go design what the rest of the recipe is and say you wind up uh, seeing what works well for you. But uh, that's one side of this one. Yeah. These actually will wind up being bigger because they'll stand up bigger. They'll wind up being being taller all the way around. So it just becomes a bigger or bushier palette all the way around. That's not good too much. As Bernie said, we could spend a whole class on how to use one of these tools. Um, if you've never used one, it can be a little bit of a daunting task. What we'll do is I'll put a drop of head cement on this. Usually I, I put them on the undersides. I show you a trick. Whack. Great. And get a little bit of. That's just clear nail polish, right? Clear nail polish. Clear Sally Hansen's. <laughs> I put a little thinner in my mind. Um, I don't use it straight out of the bottle. Straight out of the bottle, it's thick. And as it starts to be used and you're opening and closing, opening and closing, opening and closing, it's thicker. Um, so what I use is a, is, is a little bit of acetone. It's easier than trying to find nail polish um, thinner. You can use nail polish remover. If you wind up using nail polish remover, make sure it does have some kind of an acetone base. Ooh, well, use the other stuff. <laughs> it's all kind of geel. And next thing you know, you got a big ball. And um, I take... I use two bottles. I never use. I never use a full bottle. What I do is I take the end of the uh, the brush of itself. You see me here? You see the brush? Yep. It's full of. With the brush, as I cut it right off until I have two left. <laughs> That's it. That seems to be more than sufficient in order to get in and out. Where are you go? Right about there. To make it pointed, to get in and out uh, on a small fly or any kind of fly, which is one drop. So it works really well. That was something I learned from. Um, another uh, fly, fly tire actually online. I think I think it was Plagler, might have been where I got that one from. Either that or I got it from Kelly Gallup, um, who's a 
interesting tire. But... Yeah, he does the tips. Yes, I look at you because you know him you know, <laughs> personally. Now, the way you can tell, the way you can wind up clearing out that mess if you think you've got it in the eye, save one, save the end of a cutoff of a of a, of a small hackle. Strip off all the stuff on the end. It's really pretty stiff. And if I can see this tonight, look how many lights. Let me do it over here. There, there you go. <laughs> Stick it through the eye. All you do is just pull it through the eye once, and that clears out the inside of the cement. And the inside of the middle. Oh, that's a good trick. Yeah. This is a good trick. Something on very small flies um, that uh, still got that little. I can't when you wind up getting um there you go. Yep, yep. You wind up going to the stream with these, a lot of times you can't put a tippet in them because you can't see them. I mean, let's face it, we're not getting any younger to do this. Yeah, you tiny so what I do with all my midges is I wind up tying a piece of uh tippet on them to start with. <laughs> of home. I just pull off about two feet. In fact, actually what I wind up using is number four mono. You can use, uh, and, and that works out fine for me. I just pull off two feet, tie them all up, wrap it around my finger once and flip the slide through it. It sticks there. That way I put it in a different, in, in my Python box, and usually it's my uh, open box, and it worked really well. You can do it. You can see it. And all you have to do now is just tie the tippet on. You don't need to tie the fly on. <laughs> Okay, that was a Griffith net. I think I said two materials. That's all that was. Um, piece of small hackle, size of size of the hook, and um, peacock roll. <laughs> this is going to be difficult. So this is a caddis, right? This is going to be a caddis, right? A caddis. caddis. Something everybody does a lot, like elk hair caddises. If you don't use elk hair, use deer hair. <laughs> um, Yeah, bigger hook. That's all. Tying everything tonight on a little bit bigger hook so you can see it a little easier. So a caddis fly kind of looks like a little moth is the best when you, if you see one. And um, this fly works very well on the, uh, we talked about the Cohocton River, which are, we are kind of the stewards of and uh, very effective fly down there. And definitely about caddis. adult. Uh, Caddis and small stoneflies, first tied by, by a man called Al Troth in 1957 from Pennsylvania. Um, they usually are tied somewhere between a 12 and a 20. And uh, it's a number of different materials. They're fairly simple to tie. Hard part is at the end. Let's see if I can do this with, oh, let's see it tonight here. So, I had to start about an eye's length behind the uh, behind the, the eye. What color is that? Red thread or brown? Brown. Okay. It's light brown. What size? Nice red. Oh, lots of uh, fourteen. I'm a medium. And we'll put in a piece of tinsel or a piece of wire. 
this is mostly going to add to um, durability, as is the uh, the, the, uh, the hackle. Now, this is off a rooster cape. Now, rooster capes are very even all the way. As you can tell, this is the, this this is all one piece. It's, it's the same size from here to here. Um, you can get these in bugger packs. They work really well as far as cheap, as far as uh, cost is concerned, as far as these. Um, this happens to be, it's, they're already come pre-sized. This was a was sized already as, as a 12, yep, um, on, uh, on a gauge. So I'm gonna tie this in first. The end off. Mm. We have as tires, what we use is gauges. We use the hook as the gauge of what, what we're going to wind up with, proportion-wise, where to start. Proportion-wise can be used by the size of the eye of the hook, where the point of the hook is, where the barb would be if it's a barbed hook. Usually very few things go past the barb into the bend. If we wind up doing things um, uh, uh, on a curved hook, we usually go past that part of it as far as uh, when we tie things in. But most things are done between usually a, a hook eye behind the hook is where we usually start and go to the part where the bend is. And the bend is just about the point where the barb would normally, normally be. And that's right where, the, where my thread is hanging right now. I'm gonna tie in the tinsel. That Notice that I'm pulling on the thread. That's the important, that's where the tension comes from. The tension in the direction to help you do this comes from the end of the bobbin. Um, is the way it's coming out. And you can pull on it. The, the tension in the, in, the, in the thread is held by these things on both sides because they're in there with strictly by, by force. So you can, if you want to increase it, you bend them in a little bit, you want to decrease a little bit, you pull them out a little. Um, they do make a bobbin called the right bobbin, which half a thick. That this one, is, yeah, these guys there. Um, and on the, on the side of the bobbin is where you, where you load the thread. Right here, you can tighten it up or you can loosen it down, which ends up giving you more and more, more or less tension as far as on your thread. The end of the bobbin kind of helps you direct where you're going with the thread. So this is kind of your direction. If you wind up being loose like this all the time, you can't wrap things around the hook. It thinks it's not going to work. So you got to have tension. By keeping the tension, you can wind up directing it to, to the front, to the back, where you want to go and how tight you want to, you want to tie things on. How tight to make things when you tie the material on is a feel. And that's something you just have to learn to do. Um, if you pull it on too tight, it'll snap. You'll break the thread right off as far as that goes. Then you um, have to rethread the bobbin, and, which is- uh, It's gonna be a little bit uh, kind of a daunting task sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, now coming up with this thing called dubbing. Dubbing is a material, it can be all kinds of crazy hairs, all kinds of hairs masks, synthetic. Most of us now use a synthetic material. This is super fine by Wapsi. Um, less is more. Man, I, I can't stress that more. You can always add more, it's a hell of a thing to kind of take off. So that's the only problem with some, some of the things is to, to get them off of there. So you wind up pulling a little bit off of the off the line here. You can use a material called dubbing wax if you like. 
I use these little spit works just as well. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Overdressing a fly when the first time you ever fly something, you wind up, it's act. <laughs> you look, and then you look at it, you say, God, that looks really good to me. <laughs> Ends up looking like kind of a fly time bumblebee or yes. something in Sonova. Fly time <laughs> is an art in a way, but to tie a fly to catch a fish is a little bit of a practice. <laughs> and it's not a lot of practice. It's something you can do. Um, and it's a thrill. The first time you wind up catching something on something you tied, as Bernie said before, he says it's, you know, it, 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 it's it's nice. It is. It's just, well, when I tied that, that doesn't nail it. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna start right at the back end here. I started with about an inch and a half to two inches of dubbing on here is what I did. I wanna end up with a semi-tapered body, but it doesn't gonna to have to be that tapered. It's not gonna be that important. Um, so I'm just gonna, it's super fine. You can tighten it up pretty good and start at the back. Now you notice I left a little bit of space in there because I know there's something to be tied in there. So you gotta have to leave yourself a little bit of extra space here. Okay, now I'm gonna grab the hackle. Four or five turns up the front. Back a little, yeah. a couple underneath. Stop. Back a little. Grab my pencil. They're kind of weaving it in between the hackle. Between where the hackles ended up. Here again, a little more bling. <laughs> Especially if it's a sunny day, the light will reflect off these kind of shiny things like the beads and whatever, and that really uh, will attract fish. And... Ah, deer hair. This is a piece, this is actually a piece of bleached deer hair. Um, I didn't have any oak, so I'm going to use deer hair, but like I said, most people around here, a lot of times you will use deer hair. There's plenty of deer around. <laughs> the thing you have to remember is this is a floating fly. When you put hair on it, hair is hollow, only it isn't hollow all the way. The hollow parts is near the end. That's going to be solid, and the hollow part's going to be down a little bit farther. So you have to be a little bit careful about what you use. Some hairs are not hollow. Elk, caribou, moose hair is not hollow. Deer hair is, and there's plenty around. And um, I got using deer hair for a long time rather than elk and plenty of hunter friends. <laughs> and where most of this comes from. I don't hunt any longer myself. Okay, now how much do you use? I'm going to say you're going to wind up using. Now here's going to be a strange thing to say. I'm going to use about a half a pencil, um, about a half a diameter of what a pencil is. If you pull it straight up from the from the hide, 
and cut it off close to the bottom of the hive. Hold it in one hand, and maybe you can see this. No, I'm doing it up here. I want to see all the crap I'm going to pull out. You want to get all, <laughs> you want to get all these fuzzies out of here and the stuff at the bottom. Make some long stuff out of the top too at the same time. Put in your hair stacker. Put the tips down, right? Tips down, because you want the tips down. Oh. <laughs> now, to keep it from moving back and forth in your hands a lot, if you take your hair stacker and when you go to take it apart, if you have the hair, if you have the hair in the direction of where you want to put it on, Half the battle already started. That's because it's already going to be in this direction. The fly is going to have to be. They're going to have to be as a wing to happen in the back. Grab them with one hand. And from here, you can pull out anything left left over. There's a little stray one right there. Now you want this to be a little bit longer than the hook. The reason why you want it to be a little bit longer than the hook is when you cinch it down, it's gonna stand upright this way and it'll be as long as the hook. So what I do is I try to say, okay, about that. As you ever, each time you move from finger to finger, I rotate it about 90 degrees. That helps, that keeps them as a, as a bunch, it keeps them together. But if you keep on moving it back and forth without rotating the bunch, it ends up gonna be flat. I want this to splay out on top. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure from the from the eye of the hook to the end of the end of the hook, about to there. Grab it with my other hand. I'm going to do a pinch wrap, which means I'm going to pick it up, grab it with the top of my fingers, and just let it fall over on the other side. But before I do that, I'm going to spin my thread in a counterclockwise direction. By doing that, if you bring it up as a loose wrap, it'll go towards the towards the back of the hook, what gives you something easier to hang on to. Bring it down as a loose wrap, bring it down again. Then take it, you think it's about right, just pull. As you start to pull, it'll start to flare. Don't be afraid to go ahead and if you don't like the way it's doing, pull it up a little bit. So four or five and I look at it. Yes, that's good. Hold the bunch up. Two or three underneath. And kind of hold the head up. Good thing about this is you can kind of get your wick finish in underneath. Underneath would be nice if you can't get it underneath. You know. Now imagine. Now what you do is you grab all this that's left over, use the hook eye as the guide, put your scissors against, bring it up with one big swoop or one cut, make the head. And a little short. That's all right, it's a small <laughs> From here you can go ahead and you can. Trim it up a little bit. Again, I'll put a drop of cement in the bottom. I can't see it, thank you. Sure, I got this. That's cleaning out your uh, yeah. hook eye again. Yeah. That's a good trick I learned tonight. Two things I learned the toothbrush and the uh, using this. 
<laughs> yep. I just keep reusing it over and over again. They eventually get a little bit of beat up and whatever else. <laughs> Keep my own flies. It could have been a little bit more of a wing on top, but it'll fish. Yep. Questions, comments? Nice little. I said, it's a real effective fly locally on the Cohocken River. It's a, it's a lot of fun to catch. This is a practice thing. Yep. Anybody can tie a fly. <laughs> Anybody can tie a fly that'll catch something. <laughs> Don't try something complicated first time starting. Make it simple on yourself, make it easy on yourself. Um, materials, I have a tendency to stay away from fly tying kits, but it's a good way to get started. They give you the what you need right then and there. You don't have to go out and buy a lot of things. It even comes with hooks, it comes with everything um, right off the bat. Um, if it becomes a necessity of, to, of tools, you need a bobbin. It, for reality, you don't need a bobbin. You need a bobbin and a good pair of pliers and some way to tie a knot at the end. You can use half hitches. Those are easy to do. Um, you can use the end of a pen to do a half hitch. You just hold it up and you go around once and put it up to the eye and pull it off. It goes right on as far as you, you just use a pen barrel. Um, yeah, you can use those and good. This is somewhat simple to, simple to come up with and need some way to hang on to the hook. It should be the your vice should be good enough that when you put the put your hook in the vice. Notice that I did that every single time. Should be able to go, and it doesn't move. <laughs> That's the important part. If it, if it's moving, tighten the vice up. If the vice is all the way tight, it's not going to be a good vice. I had a friend who was a good tire. Um, he passed away a couple of years ago. He didn't have a vice, and you're going to laugh at this one. Took a pair of needle nose vice grips and ground them down, <laughs> and that's what he used. <laughs> it worked. Sorry, Barney. There you go, buddy. Um, and that's what he tied with. And he tied with, he was, he tied that with for 40 years. He had exactly what he was using. It was a good old pair, just a pair of vice grips, is all it was. <laughs> and, uh, he said, I'm not buying one of those vices. They're too expensive. I don't need one of them. I just use one of these. <laughs> and he did. And, uh, but, but those are pretty much the things you need. Um, and don't get, don't get complicated with it. It's, it's not a complicated uh, activity. It shouldn't be. It should be something to be enjoyable and don't rush. You don't have to tie, you know, 100 flies in an, in an evening. You don't have to fly 10, 10 flies in an hour. Um, if you get more proficient at it, that's uh, it'll just sort of just happen. And the one thing that that uh, other tires that I've learned from, um, whether it be online uh, or uh, in person, is that um, if you want to get more proficient at a fly, tie a dozen. And that's exactly what it is. I mean, the first two or three or four might be terrible. By number 12, all of a sudden you'll say, wow, that's pretty good. <laughs> um, you can try to save the flies that have come out terrible. The easiest way to do it is with a razor blade. I don't have a razor blade with me, but I got your razor. Grab everything on the back on a new one and you start at the back and just kind of go like this with a brand new razor blade and all the stuff will come off. Right. Yeah. They wind up saving a hook is what you wind up doing. But other than that, um, and like I said, it's practice. And if you get frustrated, get up and walk away. You know, this is supposed to be fun. That's what it is. And, uh, you know, make it fun. And, and... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't start with something real, real small. You know, I, it, it start with something which is which is larger. <laughs> get an idea on how the material goes on. Get an idea on how things lay down. Um, get an idea. You get a technique of your own on how uh, how to put things on, on on a hook and how to work with uh, work with the thread. And uh, I think you'll you'll be maybe you'll keep with it. Maybe you won't. I mean, you know, I started <laughs> 25 years ago, and then I got away from it for a long period of time. And 
when I came back to it about 10 years ago. So um, <clears throat> it just, it's a practice thing. You know, at the first, when I first came back to it yesterday, mine were terrible. <laughs> they were big globs. You're right. Ralph. They, were, they were those wonderful looking big things that they were sort of like, I'll say, well, ugly is only uglier. <laughs> All right, well, thanks, Paul. That's, that was really good. That was. Um... <laughs> this is our first attempt at doing this online and with this camera here. So we're. Yeah, we'll see. We'll uh, see how it comes out. No one's complained online yet. So <laughs> no one over in here. So uh, we're almost uh, uh, done. We want to do a couple of quick things. Uh, John's going to talk about some of the um, online uh, resources we have. And actually, if you just click on each of those links there, that'll, uh, yep, they're all working. Because um, in the old days, when we started to do it, you sat there literally with a cookbook and, you know, paper and, and then uh, DVDs came out. That was like a huge leap forward. And um, now um, just about anything you want to learn about fly tying is online somewhere on YouTube. And, yeah, so so thanks. So when we started our built our website, what a year or so ago, a couple yeah. years ago, you know, we wanted to make sure we had some educational things, instructional things. So, uh, Gordon, I'm not sure who found these or did you guys create these? I can't remember how we started with these, but we wanted to at least put this information up on the website so that we could have um, fly tying, uh, fly casting other information about the sport itself and the recreation, along with a lot of uh, conservation stuff that, uh, that we do as well. So when you go to our, our website, uh, CanandaguaLakeU.org, uh, you'll see a section that talks about fly tying. Uh, when you click that link, you're, you're gonna have a link to this site here. You'll have a number of different, I won't click on them, I don't think, but uh, they'll start talking and things. But you'll see there's at least 18 videos here. You'll see some of the similarities. You see the same kind of close-ups that you just saw Paul do. Uh, a number of different types of flies to tie. Um, I watch them. I'm, I'm a beginner as well. I'm not a fly tire as well. I'm going to learn. Uh, so I'm planning on using these as well. Um, these are tight line video is a gentleman uh, from New Jersey, Tim Flagler. He's a good friend of Ralph's. Um, is that where we got them from? Yeah, okay. I just found his site and copied them to our page here. So, yeah, and these are the patterns we teach in our school, um, as well as some other ones. So, uh, he had them for just about every pattern we had. Uh, how do I go back to the? I just hit the back arrow. Back arrow. Is that where you are? Oops. And yep. And then we also came up with a, a glossary of terms. I think we took that from Orvis's uh, site itself, but we wanted our site to kind of sort of be the launching point for everything you need, resources you need, information you need. Uh, so we wanted to put the links here as well. So you can see there's all types of terms and of uh, for, for the fly, uh, for the reel, the rod, everything there. But down below here, you'll see uh, a number of terms that you might wanna, you might hear, you're not sure what they are. These are just fly related terms down here. So you can see all the different parts that Paul was talking about today. Um, all the different pieces of, of, of information you need are right here. Um, let's see, what else do we have? This is the website itself. So you can see here at uh, right there's the fly time um, site here. And I think, do you have the Orbis link as well on that page too? Uh, if you go back, you'll yeah, come out there. It's up there. I forgot my mouse, so there it is. That's all right. Yeah, <laughs> it's the pressure. I'm not. Yeah, so here's the Orbis version of the fly time video. So they also have a pretty good um, learning center here. So uh, you can get that from our site as well. But here's the fly time videos. Uh, there's techniques. There's uh, all the dry flies or merger fly. Everything you need here. Uh, if you go to the techniques page, there's an it, it's about the fly tying technique. So a lot of the things that you probably heard Paul say today, you know, here's how to wrap floss bodies, all the different uh, pieces and components and, and stuff that you would look at. They give you some tips on how to best do those pieces here. So we wanted to make sure that we, you know, we're trying to be as informational as if anyone has anything that you'd like to see launch from the site, we can include that as well. Um, 
but we wanted the site to be, uh, you know, very informative, very helpful. Um, let's see. And I think that's all we have at this point right now. Well, there's some of the brick and mortar yeah. stores too around here that sell fly tying. Yeah, so there's, uh, we, I go to the one in the Pittsburgh Plaza here in Rochester, but there's a number of other stores you can go to, like Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's and things like that. And the craft stores like uh, Michael's over in the, near the mall. This is where I'm not guys with surprising. Yeah, that's right, over in Henrietta. In Henrietta, yeah. I remember okay. the new Hobby Lobby store in Vicker, but they probably sell similar. Hobby's got quite a bit of <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so there's a lot of places to buy the materials and, and god knows there's enough places online yes <laughs> oh yeah yeah all right well that's all i had all right so uh we'll wrap this pretty quick and um uh, let's see we got still got a little library closes at eight so we got about half an hour here um so i just want to talk i saw most of you signed up for the school um and um so we're going to do that every uh, Wednesday in March uh, from 6 to 7.45. Library, like I said, closes at 8. So from the March 1st to the 29th, um, we're charging a $20 material fee. You were saying the link didn't work to collect that yet, or we'll work that out. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, the only thing you'll need to do are, uh, 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 if you don't have the tools or things, um just acquire those on your own now if you have a the device is um we know is the expensive piece i think we have a couple of spare ones uh we can loan out um so um paul you said didn't you and uh, some of that a couple of devices that uh, yeah don't need to yeah so well uh yeah don't let the uh, price of entry for the device uh, stop you we can get the tools and things um and then the registration is through the uh, library's um, uh, event center here. Um, there you go. And uh, so far we've got, um, looks like, I think they set it up for up to 15 people or so, or no, it was 20. Yeah, hey, something like that. So we got about eight or nine folks in it and there's still a month or two be, uh, of registration. So um, this, uh, like I said, we used to do this, um, in Canandaigua at the Wood Library. This will be the first time that we've done it in Victor. And um, so we're excited for that because the library reached out to us and uh, and uh, we kind of started a partnership with, with the library here. Um, so that was it for the program. Now we've got enough time. If you want, we can set some vices up and play around with tying plies or are there any other questions before we uh, close out for the night? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. You just pinch the barb. Yeah. 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 That's a good safety uh, feature. Just. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, if you ever catch a hook in your face. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That never happens to me. John's on. <laughs> so, but uh, here's just a couple other patterns that the people have tied up. These are called clouser minnows, which is a real effective bait fish. These are, I believe, called scuds. Scuds, and that's a uh, that's called the missing link fly. This one is a little bit of everything on that one. It kind of looks like a caddis and some other stuff. So um, that's it. I'm going to uh, turn off the recording. Um, so. Thank you, um, those on Zoom here. And uh, if this came out good, we'll put it up on YouTube. And if it doesn't, we'll won't. <laughs> so. well, just a question.